Thank you, Ray. Two very quick announcements before we move on. First of all, you will notice in the breaks that there are books from many of our speakers out in the hallway right outside the theater, so you can browse those. There's also t-shirts and a variety of other things. Second, I neglected to give a special thanks to Amy Willey, who has been the driving force behind this event in my opening remarks, so sorry about that. She has done everything from selecting and inviting the speakers to arranging all the logistics and even providing live tech support on the website. So if you chatted with someone, it was probably her. So thank you very much to Amy for making this the best Singularity Summit yet. I'll give just a second so we can kind of get those that need to make a bathroom break out and get the rest into our seats. Our next speaker is Dr. Stephen Badalak. Dr. Badalak is a professor of surgery at the University of Pittsburgh, and he's the deputy director of the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine. He began his career at Purdue University in 1983 and has, pa has practiced both veterinary and human medicine. Over the last 20 years, and initially in animals, Dr. Badalak has pioneered the medical application of tissue growth technology. He is most famous, perhaps, for regrowing fingers, but likely more important is his work regrowing portions of esophagi, tendons, bladders, blood vessels, and even hearts. Dr. Badalak has earned 50 US patents, 200 patents globally, and has authored more than 200 scientific publications. He has served extensively at the National Institute of Health and advises several major medical device companies. Dr. Badalak is here to discuss the fundamental progress in regenerative medicine and potential for the future. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Badalak. Thank you very much. Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and it, I, I was fascinated by this previous talk. And so as you just heard uh, our attempts to, uh, our predictions actually, that we're gonna transcend the, the limits of, of biology. What we're trying to do in regenerative medicine is actually capture even a fraction of what the potential of of, of biology is, because if we can do that, I think we can, we can take care of a lot of disease problems that are, that are affecting the quality of life right now. And uh, one thing that you'd like to keep in mind as uh, you listen to the next 20, 25 minutes or so, is that what we're talking about here is, is not necessarily increasing quantity of life, but quality of life. Now, I think they both, they both go together because we, we solve certain problems, but uh, let me, um, let's see, I should probably walk, stand over here. That's what I should do. <laughs> the, uh, if we can advance these slides, maybe. Let's see. Okay. All right, let's see, where should I be aiming this to advance this? Technology. It looks like we've got a little, <laughs> a little advancement to do here. Hmm? No, it's, it's lighting up. I don't know. Oh, there we go. All right, good. So I'm, I'm going to split this talk into into three, uh, three parts. I'm going to a little bit of philosophy, uh, philosophy about regenerative medicine, uh, and then I'm going to give you a little background on one approach to reconstructing or. I don't like to use the word regenerating because it implies that we can, we can perfectly recapitulate what happens when we're a fetus in developing tissues. So I avoid the word regeneration pretty much. I use things like constructive remodeling of tissues. And then I'm gonna give you some clinical applications. So a little philosophy. Well, what, what is this field of regenerative medicine? Some people, it used to be called tissue engineering. Now it's called, more, more commonly called regenerative medicine. And a very simple definition is what we're trying to do is replace functional uh, tissues. If, if you've got a missing body part or an injured body part, what, we want, what you really want is something that can replace it that works what, whatever it is that you were uh, missing. 
And uh, there's a lot of fancy definitions out there, but basically that's what we want to do. So why does the field exist? And in my opinion, the bottom line is there's a lot of things that we don't treat very well, or maybe we can't even treat at all. And, and here's a short list of these things. The, um, for example, uh, esophageal cancer. How many in the audience here have uh, reflux disease? Yeah, it's about right, about 10%. You know, or you know, maybe you know somebody with, uh, with uh, esophageal cancer. 10% of you with reflux disease will develop a condition called Barrett's esophagus, and that'll go on to, to turn into cancer. And our treatment for that right now is removing your esophagus because we can't treat it. And I'll give you an example of that in a little bit. You have a stroke. There's very few people that think that we could recreate a functional part of the cerebral cortex. Now, maybe after the last talk, we may be able to do that, but right now, we're, we can't. You lose a limb, nobody expects us to regrow it. So our, all of our treatment strategies are based on things that we think are limits in the way that we can heal. So, esophage, so regenerative medicine uh, comes along and says, maybe, maybe that's not necessarily true. If we think about these problems in a different way, rather than the traditional medical research paradigm that's, that we practiced for the past 50, 100 years, perhaps we can think about, uh, we can come up with strategies that would work. So this may be the single most important slide that I show because it's, uh, it, it, it basically is the way we think about medicine and our response to injury that uh, we've had this for, for 100 years. Uh, so when you injure tissue, you, you uh, stop the bleeding by, by clotting the blood, and then cells come into the tissue, you get an inflammatory cell infiltrate, the cells in the injured tissue die, fibroblasts come in, they start to organize, they deposit new matrix around themselves, which organizes, and that turns into a scar, and that's what we think of as tissue repair. And there's lots of details that go into each one of these arrows and each one of these steps. But the bottom line is, you, we've all experienced this. You get a cut on your arm, it, it, it bleeds. For the next couple days, it's red, a little bit swollen, and you end up with a little bit of a scar. If you're only two years old and that happens, the scar probably disappears. As we get older, we can't get, we, we, the scarring gets a little bit more severe. And in fact, an interesting uh, fact uh, that some, some people may not be aware of is that up until 16, 18 weeks of gestation, uh, we can actually regenerate a lot of tissues that uh, we can't after that point. At mid-gestation, we start to develop a very sophisticated immune system, our ability to you know, recognize pathogens and develop antibodies against them uh, and such, but what we lose is our ability to regenerate tissues. So it's a trade-off. As we become more sophisticated organisms, we've had to make those sorts of trade-offs. And so we develop this mechanism of, of, of scar tissue and tissue repair so that we survive injuries. So in the last 100 years, the real um, advances, all, all the advances I think can be lumped into three areas. We, we don't bleed to death very, very much anymore unless it's a catastrophic accident somewhere where you don't have help. We have loads of different medications that control inflammation. Everybody, you know, everybody in this room is taking Advil or, or Nuprin or uh, you know, your ver aspirin, which are anti-inflammatory medications. And we've, got, we've gotten very good at that, and particularly with surgery. We now, laparoscopic surgery, arthroscopic surgery, instrumentation is just incredible. We get people out of the hospital in, in hours or, or days where it used to be weeks. The scars are smaller, but fundamentally, we've not changed uh, any of this. We're just modifying these steps. At the end of the day, we still end up with a, with a scar. Now, regenerative medicine says if, if, if we're really going to solve some of those problems I just showed you, we probably, we've got to change this. And it's, we, we really can't go down here to the bottom and expect to change something right at the end, let all of this other stuff happen, and then magically end up with a different result. So we, we, we probably have to work up, up high. And this is where you hear about things like stem cell therapy. So at a site of injury, you put in a bunch of stem cells. Maybe they came from your umbilical vein that your parents saved, or maybe your, your bone marrow. Uh, and if that's the case, then this probably should be called something other than inflammation. Let's call it a constructive cell infiltrate, whatever it is. And right, what you're looking at are the different ways in which regenerative medicine are practiced. Some people will, will use a cell-based therapy here. Some people, like myself, will use a scaffold-based approach. Others will develop drugs, a pharmacologic approach, and those three approaches eventually all have to come together. But if that happens, and we're successful, then everything down here has to change. And this, to me, is the biggest right, the right step in our ability to, um, to translate regenerative medicine 
to the, to the, uh, to the patient. And let me give you a good example. Stem cell therapy. Everybody, everybody knows what stem cell therapy is. So let's say you, you get an injury, you put a bunch of stem cells at the site of injury, and 10% of them survive, and they start to grow because the, you put them in, and, and this is what you want them to multiply. It takes them maybe 10 days, maybe two, 20 days to reach a class, and then they start to um, uh, need a blood supply, so they bring in all of these capillaries. Now, I'm a physician, and if you're looking at the site that you put these things, now it's three, four weeks after the surgery. You've got swelling because of uh, uh, this ma increasing mass of cells trying to turn into the right type of tissue. It, it's recruiting a blood supply, so it looks red. Because it's got a rich blood supply, it's warm. So you've got a swollen, red, warm spot at the site of surgery. Now, you, you come into the doctor's office, what's he going to think? Infection, right? I and mean, they're trained to think infection. We're, we're, we're programmed to think infection or inflammation. Something's not right. And yet we did something we wanted to be different, but we, when something different happens, we've got all of these barriers to accepting it. You've got your colleagues saying, you're not practicing the standard of care. You've got lawyers waiting to sue you if things go wrong with that, uh, with that surgery. You, you've got third-party reimbursement issues that say, this is so, you know, no, this isn't proven to save money, so we're not going to reimburse. Everything works against this sort of innovation. So the bigger the leap, the better the, the, the advancement, the more difficult it is to take it to patients. We're going to talk about, about more on that in a minute. You need just a little bit of a primer on biologic scaffolds, and I'm going to go through these slides very quickly so I can get to the examples at the end. So these are the three ways in which you can look at uh, uh, regenerative medicine. At the end of the day, like I said, they all have to come together to form some sort of a tissue. What you're looking at here is a piece of extracellular matrix, or ECM. The extracellular, or outside the, I, by the way, I love the analogy to our body and the cells being a bunch of little machines because it's such, a, a, such an, a, a, a functional way of thinking about what goes on in the cell, and, and it's how we can you know, recreate this uh, uh, artificially. But the, this extracellular matrix are, is basically the um, environment in which every cell in our body lives, the, and each cell makes its own environment. Cells secrete things. Sometimes there's just a little bit of it, like in the brain, there's not a lot of extracellular matrix because there's got to be a lot of communication in the tendon that you're, you're mostly extracellular matrix. But this matrix 30 years ago used to be thought of as having mainly one function. It gives structure and strength and form to tissues, holds things together. It's almost just flipped, uh, flipped now 180 degrees. It's recognized that this environment that the cells secrete is an information highway between the cells, tells the cells you should divide, you should look like this shape, you should move over here, you should uh, uh, differentiate into a particular tissue. So the, the matrix is now thought of as an information highway, more, much more so than its structural components. And like I said, it's made by the each, each individual cell, so that means your matrix within, within each tissue is a little bit different. And so what we're able to, we've been able to take these matrices, like I, that, that matrix I just showed you a picture of, was actually taken from the urinary bladder of a pig. And almost all patients that have been treated with this approach up till now have used a xenogeneic implant, meaning a different species. So one might ask, well, how can you take a pig's extracellular matrix and put it into a person? And the main reason is that there are no cells there. On the, on the surface of the cells are the epitopes that say, oh, you're foreign, I need to reject you. But the matrix, is so important that it's been, been um, uh, served through evolution to an extent that when a pig's matrix is put into a human and probably a dinosaur or a mouse or a rat or, or whatever species, we don't recognize it as foreign. What we, let me restate that. We recognize it as foreign, but it's, it sends good signals rather than danger signals. And so that's an important, important concept to keep in mind. Nature, Mother Nature, one way to think about the matrix is a, is a medical device that's gone through hundreds of millions of years of R&D, the trial and error. And so we've got like the perfect scaffold now in which all of these cells can survive. And we learned, we've learned a lot about how they work. They, they're temporary. If we put them in as a device, all we want them to do is change the way that that body heals at that spot where we put it. We're not interested in changing the brain if the injury's in the toe. 
and, and, or even the other arm if it's, or distal arm if it's a proximal injury. So we put it at the site. We also know that when it degrades, it releases all of this information that it's stored up. And much of the information doesn't even exist as information until you get degradation of the scaffold, which is really cool. Because the time it's released is when the, when, the sca when the scaffold gets degraded. In other words, at a time of injury. We get this inflammatory cell response that comes in, releases a bunch of enzymes, degrade. Now all of a sudden a bunch of signals start getting released from this matrix. We modulate the, the immune response so that it becomes friendly rather than destructive. And the, and the main thing, I'm gonna give you just a quick example is, this is, a, this is actually a form of stem cell therapy. Uh, it, it, it's exogenous it's stem cell therapy rather than exogenous. We're not collecting stem cells and putting them at a site. We're recruiting them. This, think of it as a homing device. Now, let me uh, see if I can get this movie to run. I'm not sure I can do it. Yeah, here we go. Uh, this is true regeneration. That's, this is a little film put together by the Howard Hughes Foundation. In six to eight weeks, this newt or salamander regrows a perfect replica of what was amputated. In fact, if you amputate at the elbow, that's all it grows back is everything from the elbow out. Amputated at the shoulder, grows from the shoulder out. And this was made for, for high school kids to show what happens. And I'm going to show this for a reason here. And there's usually a voiceover, but I'm going to be your voiceover. Okay. So they get, get a little bleeding, bleeding stops. Now, the cells in the surrounding tissue in this regenerating species, because they can regenerate portions of their heart, their eye, their central nervous system, they accumulate at the site in a couple of weeks, and this is called the blastema. This blastema is an accumulation of pre-programmed stem cells right here. They come from the bone, they come from the cartilage, they come from the muscle, and they know what to do. They know that I should divide, I should turn into muscle, I should be on the top side of the arm rather than the bottom. There should be, you know, five digits, one should be longer than another. It's like, how does it know? Now, if we figured that out, it'd be game, set, and match, and we could go home, because regenerative medicine, you know, we'd have done everything we could possibly do. So the, the, what, the, the, that is regeneration. What I'm gonna show you is not that. In fact, our if we could do that with stem cell therapy, again, we'd, we'd have it done. The problem right now with all the different types of therapy that you see is we put the stem cells there, and then we put them in a site where there's injured tissue, and we hope something good happens, and it doesn't happen. I mean, there's not been a, a single stem cell therapy trial now that's, made, that's changed the way we practice medicine with, with, with the outcomes. Incremental changes, yes, but nothing's been a game changer to date. So let, let's look at what happens at the site of these scaffold placements. This is from a patient uh, in, in, uh, UC, at UCLA. Dr. John Edamura did this uh, shoulder repair on this patient, put in a scaffold to regrow a, a rotator cuff. We had to go in eight weeks later to, uh, for a whole other reason, said let's biopsy this and see what's going on. So if you look at this, this accumulation of cells with new, that doesn't look anything, remember, the matrix that was put in had no cells in it. So everything you see here came from the patient. And if you put this in front of a pathologist, he would call that inflammation in a heart. I'm a pathologist. That is inflammation and the way we're trained to think about it. But if, we, if you ask, what is this cell? Uh, what's this cell up here, this bigger one? Or what's this one? Could be a lymphocyte. Or maybe it's a histiocyte. All these different fancy names. What's about this cell surrounding this little uh, tubule up here. Maybe that's a lining cell of a blood vessel. Where did this new, that's rhetorical questions. We don't know unless we do some very spe special staining. Now, I'm gonna give you, uh, and that turned into normal rotator cuff. I'm gonna give you three other examples of studies we've done over the past 10 or 15 years. On the left here used to be an acellular piece of a pig's small intestinal submucosa, the matrix from a pig's small intestine. And we, and we put it into a tendon location and it turned into this blue tendon up here. This is a nerve sitting right next to it. So this was acellular, but at two weeks, that looks for all the world like inflammation, but it also is just a bunch of mononuclear cells. This used to be the pig's urinary bladder, and we put it into the temporomandibular joint uh, uh, of a dog as the meniscus. So a lot of people in this audience, I will bet, have TMJ problems. And it turned into this cartilage-type tissue. Now, one more example. This was a piece of extracellular matrix that was put into a rat's abdominal wall, and it turned, it got, after a couple of weeks, got very cellular and turned into muscle. So a cellular matrix turned into three entirely different functional, un, really, you could not tell that these weren't normal tissues. Uh, and we didn't do a thing other than put a nice environment at the site of healing and then get out of the way. 
Let Mother Nature do the rest. Because we don't understand all the signals that go on after that. So, so what the question then becomes, well, what are all these cells that are accumulating there? How can they turn into tendon and cartilage and blood vessels and nerves? And so they, they, the question is, they, they, and, and how do they get there? So I'm gonna rip through these next couple slides quickly because this isn't meant to be a science lecture, but what we do is take these different forms of matrix, we, we fractionate them, uh, we break them down, uh, isolate all of these different fractions, and then what we do is we put them into a little, it's called a Boyden chamber, where we put the, uh, uh, under, this is a, a in, inside a little plate that goes under a microscope, and there's these red things represent a membrane that's got very tiny pores in it, and we put cells on the top, and we put our unknown, these little fractions from the matrix on the bottom, and say, what effect do these, these degradation products of the matrix have on these cells? And so if we put stem cells in the top, and then we put these fractions on the bottom, we can find those that attract them. And the bottom line on that is that we identified fractions, degradation products that actually recruited very potent, very potently recruited stem cells. This homing device I was talking about, and there's more than one. So Vanita Agrawal in my lab, an MD, PhD student, uh, about a year or two years ago, developed a model where we would take these mice and we would amputate their digit, it, it, it'd be the equivalent of taking your middle finger right in the second bone in the middle and amputate, it'll never grow back on its own. If you did it on a third digit, occasionally it will. And then what we did was, this is what happens if you don't do anything. Mice are really good at healing things, so in 14 days, you get complete scarring right here. Where you, I don't know if you can see this red dot, but it's got a very thick skin over the top, scar tissue right in here, and here's the amputated bone. Now, if you inject this homing device into that site of injury, this is what that looks like. Loads of cells here. And then if you look at them very close, they look a lot like those cells in those examples I just showed you. So then what, what Vinit did was he, he would isolate, uh, it's gonna be very difficult for you to see this accumulation of cells until I get over to here. He took these cells, he dissociated them, isolated them, and then he put them in a culture plate and he, ex and he let them grow up. You see, so now remember what we're talking about, the distal tip of a mouse, you know, other than seeing the mouse in your mouse trap, you know, that you occasionally catch, that's, that's small, that's a tiny little spot. Then he took these cells and he, he put them in different types of media and said, can any of the cells there turn into nerve tissue? Because there's very little nervous tissue out there, and sure enough, they can. Then he said, oh, if I take that same cell, and these are special markers that show that they're really nerve cells, let's take that same cell population, put it into a media that tends to want to form fat tissue. Are there any cells there that can form fat tissue? And the answer is yes, we can form fat tissue. A, a whole different germ layer forms that. And then they can form all different, they can basically form almost any tissue we want, all three different germ. What are those very primitive stem cells doing at the distal tip of a mouse's digit simply as a result of placing a matrix, a, a piece of pigs, extracellular matrix there? And what he went on to do is identify that they truly are stem cells. We then took and said, let's start looking at real life problems that people have that we don't treat very well. Now, so this is an, an experiment that we completed about two years ago. This is called, this is, and we're doing this under the funding from the Defense Department for the soldiers that are coming back that have been subject to roadside bombs where they've lost huge portions of their, of their limb or their, or their muscle. The, the, I'm sorry. You want me to stand over here? Okay, put the microphone. I know I'm cutting out a little bit. I'm getting instructions here. Technology. Maybe we are ahead of technology. I'm not sure. We'll see. So, so the, um, we, what we did up there at the top, in between those dotted lines, is we, we, amp, we would excise the portions of the uh, muscle, like the, and this would be the calf. So this would be like taking the, the bottom part of your, your calf all the way down almost to your heel. If, a, if, that, if you come into the ER like that, there's nothing a surgeon can do. And then we replaced it with a piece of this uh, uh, matrix, and different, uh, for this from a, a pig's uh, tissue again. And we put it right in there, and the, in, in two months, on the left here, what you see is this between the dotted lines, what the matrix is turning into. You can't really tell what, it's, what is happening there. By four months, it's actually starting to look like muscle turning into tendon tissue again. And then if we start looking at it histologically, what we start to see 
let me back up a slide, we can, that is that it, it actually is starting to form cells that are looking like muscle cells. And the markers on those muscle cells, those red dots, are the same markers that we saw on the distal tip of that mouse's toe. So we're making the same thing happen in this, this model in the dog that happens in the mouse. And then the bottom line on these slides is that by six months, this muscle is essentially normal looking. And in fact, it's got blood vessels that, that you can see all through here with these little brown uh, circular things. And if you go a little further, we can find nerves it's good, that are going through it. And if we go further, we can then do an EMG, electromyogram, where we put it electrodes on there and show that we can stimulate it and get a response. And this is the, the, the best picture that, uh, we've ever, that's ever come out of my laboratory because I'm, I'm not sure that you can see it. But every one of these red tube structures is a new, new skeletal muscle cell that's now sitting where a pig's, porso, a pig's urinary bladder matrix was. All of these green dots are the, are the attachment of a nerve to each one of these, new, of these new muscle fibers. This is essentially new muscle tissue that when you look at how strong it can contract is 50% of the contralateral normal leg. Now, we were, this was a, a really exciting result for us because we essentially were able to form new tissue from nothing. The, this is, the significance here is that we can de novo generate new skeletal muscle tissue. So this is Corporal Hernandez. He was a medic in, in Afghanistan about four years ago when, when uh, they were attacked, and he lost about 95% of his quadricep muscle. The origin of the muscle was intact, and so was the, the part just that goes to the knee. So he was our first patient about three years ago, and these are the sorts of comments he had, because he'd been through like about 25, 30 different surgeries. He says, I'm 22, or he says, I've got, am I gonna have to live like this the rest of my life? He said, why should I be going through more physical therapy? I've been doing that for years, nothing's happening. The last one, last surgery I had didn't help, why should I go through another surgery? He was giving up, he wanted amputation because he couldn't do things like walk up steps, sit down, you know, play with his, his nephews and nieces and he was depressed. So we went in and we, we actually uh, replaced that, that missing muscle where scar tissue had formed with a piece of the scaffold material, a very small piece. And this, what this picture shows is that right here on the, these are identical CT scans on the left where he should have muscle up here He's got just a little bit of connective tissue, and now we've got a signal showing that there's, there's new muscle tissue forming. And, he incre and, and the cells that, that infiltrated that, just like that dog experiment I showed you, and just like that mouse experiment I showed you, have the same primitive markers of, of stem cells. So let me, let me re recoup here for a second, recover, or uh, re review here for a second. We've got a non-treatable injury because we're missing tissue. We take a pig's extracellular matrix and use it as an inductive scaffold. We put it in the patient, it totally degrades and goes away in about 60 days. It releases signals that recruit the body's own stem cells to the site and, and, and they receive the signals because they know where they're at and can form new, new muscle tissue. And in fact, so Corporal Hernandez is now, he was just on the Huckabee show a couple of months ago showing he was lifting weights and it's totally changed his quali quality of life. Now we'd put a very small piece in and, and uh, his name's Isaiah, he wants a second surgery so he can get a little bit more. So I'm gonna show you one more, one more example. Let's see here, can we get here quick so we can leave time for a question or two. Okay. All right, we talked about esophageal cancer. I'm gonna contrast it with colon cancer. On the right, so look at the incidence of both of these. Colon cancer on the right, that's a polyp. Incidence is 0.58% per year. A Barrett's esophagus, which is the precursor of esophageal cancer, 0.5% per year, it's essentially the same. If we see a colon polyp, we go in and remove it because we know it's going to turn into cancer. If we see this in the esophagus, we don't do anything other than watch, maybe put you on antacids. And the reason is if you go in and try to manipulate the esophagus, it turns into scar tissue. Scar tissue, it's strictures, you can't swallow, the treatments in the early stages is worse than the disease. So we wait to turn into cancer, and then we, we remove the esophagus. And to me, that's a philosophy of failure. This is a barium swallow showing you get these types of strictures. We have to be able to do better than that. The gold standard is, is an esophagectomy. So we, we did a couple of studies starting 10 years ago showing that if we replaced portions of the esophagus in a, in a dog model, we got beautiful remodeling. If we replaced the entire circumference, we got lousy remodeling. And, and we would end up with this sort of stricture all of the time. 
And we said, no, what's the difference? And so we had to combine two of those modalities. We had to put the scaffold right adjacent to, to the skeletal muscle that's in the neck so that the muscle could serve as the source of cells for this, for this therapy. And so then what we did uh, was this, this study in which we were able to show, again, in, a, in an animal experiment, this is a dog where the head would be at the left and the tail of the dog would be at the right. This is the windpipe up here above. This blue line represents the, the portion of the esophagus that was removed in its entirety, like you would do in a, in a, in a patient. And there's nothing that can be done there other than to drag your stomach up through your chest and attach it to what's left in the, in the throat. And we formed this type of tissue. Now, this is not perfectly normal esophagus, but we've got muscle down here at the bottom, and you can see it in red on the left, and we've got an epithelium on the top, that, but it's not scar tissue, and, the, and the, the animal can swallow. So this is a human patient that has to go through an esophagectomy. Look at the statistics on the left. 7 to 20 percent mortality rate with this surgery. 50 percent of the patients have a problem, bleeding, stricture, infection total reduction in the quality of life because of the stomach is now in your throat. And this is our best we can do. And it's the most rapidly growing cancer in the United States. This is why regenerative medicine exists. So we took this same philosophy of changing the default mechanism of healing by placing a scaffold. And Dr. Blair Job did this all through an endoscope. Stick an endoscope down the throat. And what he did then was Right at where the esophagus meets the stomach, he made a complete 360 degree incision down through the mucosa, did the same thing up top, tunneled down at 2, 6, and 10 o'clock, and then over on the right here, if we can get that movie to run, yep, what you'll see is him stripping out the entire lining of the esophagus. It's kind of like taking your sock off inside out. Now, that would stricture one, there isn't a surgeon in the country that would do that therapeutically because it will stricture every single time. And you can imagine what, he, what this patient, you know, what this might feel like. <laughs> He's, he is under anesthesia and, you know, I don't, <laughs> and I don't know, you know whether it was you know, the bit about consciousness or not. I hope I'm not conscious. In this <laughs> so if we, if we then look at what has been taken out, this is what was removed from that patient. Now you, got some, you, know, you can tell how advanced the cancer was. We go in, take a piece of this scaffold, turn it into a tube, and basically wallpaper the inside of the esophagus. And we put a little stent in there just to hold it in place for a couple of days and then take it out. And what you're looking at here are biopsies from this patient. This is after the, taking out that mucosa. Here's the stent. On the right is the healing after two weeks, five weeks, 10 months, 13 months. And these patients are now two and three years out. And this is what uh, uh, the, the biopsies look like uh, that's just showing you that cancerous tissue had turned into normal tissue. And this is uh, Dr. Job and, and the patient the day after surgery. So it goes from... <laughs> so this is why regenerative medicine exists. And this is where, where this bringing together of the minds of the way we think of trying to reach the potential of what Mother Nature wants to do, but we can't do. All we need to do is provide the right environment if we know what that is. We don't even understand how all of this works yet, but I, I, this is where we're going with regenerative medicine, and we're, we're um, very excited about the potential. You know, I personally believe we're going to be able to treat stroke patients and recreate portions of functional thinking brain. And I don't think it's going to be, you know, 20, 30 years from now. I think it's within our lifetimes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great job. You can use this microphone. Okay, we've got time for one or maybe two questions. Very briefly, a quick announcement. Uh, the reason we had to pull Dr. Badlock to the side here was someone is using a wireless mic, probably a member of the press, and it's interfering with one that we have here on stage. So if you're using a wireless mic in the auditorium here, go to the press room and get your frequency checked and make sure that you're not the one. Um, let's take two quick questions. Maybe here right in front. Do you have the, uh, the mic here? Hello, my name is Daniel Arthur. I'm part of... Uh, number of things. Uh, cool. What I'm wondering, phoneapp.com, Long Live Research Institute, a bunch of other stuff, too many things. Getting back to your talk specifically, I saw you on 60 Minutes, and this is a great follow-on to this. Why is, notwithstanding what he's done with the psychogeal uh, uh, patients there, 
Why is this not becoming a standard of care more rapidly? I'm still not hearing this persuasively permeating the medical community. I, I saw your stuff years ago on TV. Why is this not standard of care, or are we just going to be having mayhem upon our patients no, for a while good, longer? Good question. And, and the reason is we learned that, remember that biopsy I showed you with the shoulder, with all of the problems there? So when that, was, that patient was done in the year 2000, in the next two years, that, be, that became so popular in orthopedics that everybody was starting to just put in scaffolds, whether they were good scaffolds, bad scaffolds, not knowing what to expect, panicking when the patients would come back with swelling and redness, even though the patients were fine. About half, not half, maybe 30% of the devices actually got explanted. And it's because the surgeons did not understand the technology, and you were seeing things that they were trained to say that's a problem. So what we want to do is avoid that with this particular stage. So we're doing this in a very prospective, controlled way. You know, Blair's, Blair Jobs, there's uh, eight patients that now are two to three years out. N totally normal, swallowing normal, no cancer. They, they all had cancer. They all are normal now. I mean, uh, terrific results. Outpatient therapy almost, overnight. And um, what we're doing now is bringing in other teams and training other surgeons to say, you don't just stick this stuff in here. Here's what you have to do to understand how it works, and here's what you should expect. Here's what stents to put in. That way we'll avoid everybody putting them in with 20% of the people having bad outcomes, standing up at podiums like this and saying, that doesn't work, you know, it's all ho you know, hocus pocus. And so it, it's, a, it's unfortunate, and we have to educate the FDA. They, don't, they do not understand how this works. And in fact, many very good scaffolds that could be used right now are held up because, the FDA, because of the regulations right now by the FDA. So that's a short answer to your question. No, we don't know how the FDA works, that's for sure. Yeah, that's, it's changing every day. We've got one more here on the uh -huh. aisle. Right, exactly. The question is, what's speculation as to how the cells know what it is? Now, for applications like this, we can use two parts to the question. We can use a pig's intestine and put it in the esophagus, and it knows it should be, you know, recruit those types of cells. And, however, we're now getting into what's called whole organ engineering, where we will decellularize a whole heart, a whole liver, a kidney, repopulate it, and grow it. And, you know, that needs a tissue-specific matrix. You have to have a liver matrix to put in to make a liver. Now, the direct answer to your question, though, is those cells that get there that have the potential to turn into lots of different tissue types depend upon signals at that location. So let's look at the orthopedic application, for example. If we did nothing, if we'd have put Isaiah's leg in a cast, like most orthopedic surgeons would, would want to do, say, look, this injury is too severe, we've got to let you heal before we let you start bearing weight, the scaffold would degrade, the cells would accumulate, they wouldn't know what to do because they're not receiving signals saying, I should bear weight and they go away, totally against the standard of care for, for rehabilitation. So now, Isaiah, the day after surgery, uh, was, it was doing exercise. We did two patients last week with similar problems. The day after surgery, they're, they're doing a non-traditional, so we have, to rec we have to allow the patient to let the environment teach the cells what they're supposed to turn into. It's called the microenvironmental niche conditions. So it's a, an excellent question, though. Thank you all very much for your attention. Dr. Stephen Badalak, thank you very much. Sonia Arison is here. She is a futurist and policy analyst who has studied the impact of new technologies for more than a decade. She is a senior fellow at the California-based Pacific Research Institute, a New York Times and Wall Street Journal contributor, and the author of three books. She is also an instructor at California's Command College and serves on the board of trustees for Singularity University. Her new book, 100 Plus, observes that humanity is on the cusp of an exciting longevity revolution. She examines the social, economic,